Eh, ya se escucha, ¿verdad, el micrófono? Muy bien. Eh, pues si les parece bien, vamos a iniciarlo. Déjenme ver si tenemos otro micrófono para ver cómo. No, está es muy bueno. Bueno, pues muy buenos días a todos. Sean bienvenidos a este... Pues es especial que tenemos el día de hoy sobre normalización con este, pues nuestro muy querido Charles Corre. Eh, para todos aquellos de ustedes que no conocen a Charles, me permitiré este, como persona que es muy reconocida por su normalización a nivel internacional, es una de las personas que más sabe de estos temas. Él, eh, Inició su carrera en la parte de la cultura, es ingeniero en el mundo y este, trabajó en nosotros y desde hace ya varias décadas, bueno, aquí está gracias, este, dirige, eh, ha dirigido eh, comités muy importantes que lo hizo, eh, estuvo desarrollando eh, la norma como creación hasta hace unos meses. Estuvo también en el proyecto de ley de la presentación Hablamos que se hizo para nuestros expertos, que nuestros comités expertos, que nuestros comités expertos, que Como ustedes se imaginarán, estamos en la universidad. no tenemos no tenemos no entonces les doy la bienvenida a todos ustedes, a todos los que nos presentamos en esta transmisión de la que y la verdad es que tenemos que hacer la transmisión de la institución. Les doy la bienvenida a todos los que nos presentamos. Muy buenas las instalaciones y que nos esté ayudando y facilitando la transmisión para todos nuestros expertos de la universidad que han venido a tener la transmisión de la universidad. También me gustaría comentarles que no me gustaría que 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 me gustaría como siempre se trata, me da muchísimo gusto que me presente el tema. Les voy a también, eh, si me lo permiten, hacer un par de avisos. El primero es, es que les digo que se quedan en sobre boca, porque no puedo, eh, no me escuchan si lo tengo, pero si eh, les digo que me quedan en el control de comentarios, entonces, yo no lo puedo ver en el portal. El problema es que si por el cuento de la ciudad de la hay una relación con la ciudad de la ciudad de la la que tiene que estar entendiendo la base de la ciudad de la ciudad de la pero es un libro de la ciudad. Al fondo del pasillo se encuentra un libro de dedo, a la izquierda, se lo requieran de una cuenta de la y los comentarios que están en los 
Just thank you very much for being with us uh, in the university for agreeing to conduct this uh, training for our uh, expert, the customization expert. Welcome and the floor is open. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Monica. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, the members of DGN, Director Arturo. Uh, thank you for coming today. It's a great privilege for me to be here and to be invited to speak to you. Um, I'm going to give a general introduction about standardization, but really the session is for your benefit. So please, if you have any questions about standardization, please ask. Um, I will try and answer them to the best of my ability. I cannot answer all questions about standardization. So Monica gave a very nice introduction to me. I don't need to stay with this. Um, my program is really, I'm going, I have a presentation that lasts an hour or so, and we will go through that. And then I will start looking at the ISO IEC directives, part one and part two, in a certain amount of detail, because that's where I believe those of you engaged in standardization probably have the most questions, okay? So that part could be a little bit more bureaucratic. So why do we do standardization? Mm -hmm. As you can see, I've made some quite uh, extravagant statements up there that standardization is vital to support the human world in which we live. It would fall apart without it. This is not widely recognized or understood by the world at large. That means we're not appreciated as standardizers and should be. What is the most abused standard in the world? You are looking at it. Would anyone care to guess? Is it too early in the morning? What is the most abused standard? No? No, not my real thing. It's the alphabet. Okay. What is standardized in this photo? Please give me some answers. 
The ladies? No, they're not standardized. The dress, maybe, yes. Yeah. What else? The horse? I, I think you've actually understood my question. It is surprising how often people will go but there's nothing to do with engineering in the picture. You know, but actually, oh, excuse me. But what about the sky? You know, we measure the temperature, we measure the wind speed, we have standards that dictate how you do that. We have standards on the type of clouds that we look at for meteorological purposes. Um, you focused on the ladies, their dresses, yes. There are definitions in the fashion industry for that type of dress. Uh, you were correct about the materials, the colors, the weaving. Uh, there are hundreds of standards involved in clothing making. Uh, the horses, yes, someone identified the horse, but there's also the type of horse, the, the bridle, the riding equipment, the saddle. And then what about the grass? You know, we deal with the type of grass, the soil quality, the moisture content. Standardization affects everything. But it might not necessarily be through ISO standardization. So we have to recognize that, particularly in a university type environment, where you spend a lot of time classifying things. So naming and classifying materials, items, is the first key step in standardization. Okay. So historically, standards were concerned with issues such as length, area, volume, weight, and time. Time, interestingly, was used as months, weeks, and hours, and it was only really in the Middle Ages where they started having enough precision to be able to measure minutes and seconds. And many measures were based on an individual. Now, what happened when the individual changed? You know, if you go from someone like me to someone a bit thinner, things change. But what's interesting in this picture is uh, some of the measures are still along today. So the hand is used for measuring the height of horses. You define the horse by how many hands high it is. The foot, as we know in imperial measurement systems, is still around. And the pace, the pace is actually two steps. It's one, two, uh, a thousand paces, new Apache, became the mile. So the Roman thousand paces is the measurement of the mile. That's where it comes from. How was volume measured? Well, in Roman times, they used amphora, the wine jars. They would fill up a wine jar with whatever they were trying to measure. The Japanese version was a bit more interesting. It was how much rice someone could eat. I can eat a lot more than a small person. So they had very variable standards. Uh, area was measured by the amount of land that could be plowed in a day. Uh, weight was often measured by balancing against known seeds. And today, the carrot for measuring the weight of a diamond is still based on the measure of the carob seed because the carob seed was very consistent. Uh, and time by burning of a candle or a rope or something like that. So it's fascinating where all these measures come from, but 
Then along came Napoleon and the system international measurement system in 1875, which gave us the meter of a kilogram per second and resolved most of our basic units that we work with today. So after resolving the basic unit, the next step in standardization was to look at things like the shape of materials or their strength. And this was needed because we wanted to start having interchangeable products. Now, interchangeability is a, a fascinating subject in its own right, but let me give you a short history. So the Europeans think that interchangeability really started with this general, Jean-Baptiste Vacat de Gribeval, in about 1700s. Um, where he was concerned about cannons. He wanted standardized cannon balls to go into standardized cannons so he could increase the rate of firing the cannons. Because before then, cannon balls tended to be stones or uh, handmade to fit a specific cannon. Now, although he had the idea of interchangeability, he didn't have the concept of mass production. So his cannons were still being handmade, as were the cannon balls. And there's a little bit more history about the Americans and how they ended up producing a lot of handmade rifles, but again, with interchangeable components. We then get to about the 1800s, when actually we start seeing mass production beginning to occur. And one of the earliest versions of mass production was these wooden blocks for ships, for pulling the ropes and the sails up. Um, interestingly, um, they were the, the concept behind the mass production of these blocks was by a French engineer who went to America during, this is just before the War of Independence time, to try and sell the idea to the Americans. They didn't like it, so he came to England. And England, that's one of the reasons the British Navy at that time was so superior, is it had mass production of many items for its ships. But really, metal cutting machinery didn't start occurring until about the 1800s. Um, there's an English person called Henry Maudslow, who's accredited with developing the first metal cutting lathe in about 1800. And I hope everyone understands the lathe. It's the machine where something goes round and you bring a tool to cut to exact roundness. Uh, a milling machine, on the other hand, is like a drill that can move and you can make things flat by moving it like this. And milling machines were about 1820. Now, what I find interesting is if you watch movie, American movies about the West and the Cowboys, they always talk about the Colt revolver and the Winchester rifle. But the first Colt revolver, as you can see, is 1836. So it only took about 10 years from the invention of these machines to very large scale production of admittedly relatively small engineered items, but they had completely interchangeable parts. So if a cowboy bent the, the barrel of the gun, he could just go and buy a new barrel. He did not need to buy a whole new gun. Nor did he have to go to an expert craftsman and so make me a whole new gun. So interchangeably, interchangeability, as you can see, it progressed very quickly. Uh, 1830s, the first Colt uh, pistol, then we got the Winchester rifle, mid 1800s, and then Henry Ford with complete mass production by the early 1900s. So about 80 years from the invention of these in cutting machines to full mechanical production. But that was sort of the European-American history. We forgot about the Chinese. 
um, China had invented the concept of interchangeability with typing blocks in about the 1100s. And indeed, more recently, we, we've all seen pictures of the Terracotta Army, the crossbows that they discovered with that army had interchangeable trigger mechanisms. So actually the concept of interchangeability is going back to at least 200 BCE. And there are other examples that we didn't really talk about before the general, um, the Carthaginians at the time of Hannibal had a shipbuilding system. The Venetians had a very effective shipbuilding system, and also in printing, the Gutenberg Press created standardization in movable type as well. So interchangeability has been going on a long time. It was re relatively recently introduced into standardization. So. Um, in, in the UK, and we always like to claim to be the first at everything, um, the, the engineer who designed the famous bridge in London that opened, John Wolf Barry, um, he approached the Engineering Standards Committee to uh, standardize steel beams, I beams and box beams. They were the first efforts that he wanted to achieve. And very quickly, there was a realization of the need for product conformity. So some sort of testing to prove that the products were conforming to the standard. And BSI again likes to claim its kite mark is the first product conformity mark in the world. Don't worry about taking photos. You can have the presentation afterwards. Okay. In fact, the first British standard was published in 1903, and it concerns the dimensions of metal plates or fish plates for joining railway tracks together. But BSI was not the first standards body in the UK. Um, I mentioned this man, Henry Maudsley. Well, he worked with Whitworth and others uh, for designing screw threads, because again, if you're thinking that transition from handmade to machine-made, uh, the handmade screws were inconsistent. Very difficult to cut the screw to a consistent shape. So by the mid 1840s, we started getting standardization of screw threads. And in fact, again, before the SI, but this is for my personal, I used to work for this standards body on sprinkler system standards. Uh, they were 20 years ahead of BSI, but that's just my personal promotion. So we can look at standardization in history. If we go to the Terracotta Army, about 200 BC, uh, then the Romans had systems of standardization. The Byzantines had systems of standardization. Uh, I'm someone called John Harrison made the first watches. There's a, a movie about uh, trying to monitor uh, ships moving across the world and trying to determine their longitude and latitude using watches rather than by the stars. Um, we then see the sort of growth in engineering with, I, I've mentioned Henry Maudsley. Uh, we have this Engineering Standards Committee in the UK about 1900. Um, the IEC was founded in 1906, um, way ahead of ISO, which was only founded in 1947. And today there are about 24,000 ISO standards and about 11,000 IEC standards. Okay. In terms of quality, which is where I mainly work, it's interesting to me to note that actually very early on, 1906, 
There was an investigation into the performance of using machinery for producing products. And that could really be considered one of the first sort of quality examinations. They, they may not have used the term quality at that time, but they were looking at performance and errors in workmanship, as it was called. So again, using standards to look at not only the products, but the way that people perform against those products and conformity assessment were all developed very quickly and at about the same time. More recently, we've moved in the standards world from interchangeability to looking at interoperability. So how does a telephone network operate? How do credit cards operate? I can go anywhere in the world. My phone works here. I hope, I hope everyone's turned their phone off, please. Yes. Um, but think about that. H how does a telephone system work? We have gone from uh, local national standards to having to start with international agreements on what the way theme for the signal must be for a telephone system before you start designing the transmitting and receiving equipment to match that waveform and that it can be distributed internationally. So when you say that people don't appreciate standards, everyone carries a phone, but no one realizes that without standards, you just don't have anything. And it's the same with bank cards, being able to use them all around the world except in Japan, they have a different size bank card, be warned, okay? So we're not just looking or seeking to replace parts in, interchangeably and effectively, we're making to uh, make different products and systems work together. And this indefinitely in the digital era has led, led to lots of standards about handshaking, how the different components talk to each other, what signals must be sent between them, how they must be received, etc. Now, sort of looking at the trend in standardization, we've gone from um, what was being made, the products, to how things were being made, so we defined processes. And now we're looking much more at good practices. And if I show this sort of slide, um, we have product standards, you know, railroads, things like that. Then we went to process standards, quality systems, health systems, information security. But today, we're looking at things like anti bribery standards or sustainability standards, or social responsibility. So it's no longer what you make or how you make it, it's do you apply good practices in that process. And this is reflected in businesses being more and more concerned about their reputation and protecting their brands, and that can involve protection of what's happening in their supply chains. So again, Writing these kind of standards is very different from writing product standards. Product standards, you're normally talking about dimensional things or strength issues. At this end, you're talking about concepts. Um, it makes it much harder to develop these standards because when you have a group of people sat in a room discussing their own personal concepts, and someone says, I disagree with you, they take it as personally insulting. Whereas if you were saying, well, we need this dimension, they might argue that that's right or that's wrong, but that's not a personal issue. It's just a physical issue. So actually it's changed the dynamics of the kind of discussions we have in standardization work. So 
some of the criteria that we have, and um, this is actually given in the ISO directives, is really standards need to be performance based wherever possible and not prescriptive. Okay, there will be times where prescription is necessary, but um, you should really be stating what has to be done, but not how to do it. Um, so this is so that you allow innovation in the process. I mean, I, I've given examples at the bottom here. Uh, does it really matter what color your kettle is? The boiling water or what shape it is? Some have the handle on the top, some have the handle on the side, some are done on square, some are true. Do you need to standardize those characteristics? What are the essential characteristics we need for a kettle? Well, it must hold water. It must heat that water by some means. Either you put it on the gas or you use electrical supply. It must be safe for someone to pick it up. It must be able to pour. So those are the essential characteristics. The other issues about how you make it, do you use an injection molding process? Do you use a fabrication process? Who cares? As long as it meets the essential characteristics, the performance characteristics, we're okay. Um, and you could also think about how standardizing an organization's attitude to health and safety. Now, we have standards about health and safety, and that's about trying to ensure good performance, but it, we're not telling them how to do it. You know, it's still up to the organization to decide how to do that. And in different cultures, you will have to take different approaches. Okay. So this is a fairly critical comment about standardization. Let's be performance-based and not prescriptive. What is a formal standard? This is the definition from ISO Guide 2. A document established by consensus and approved by a recognized body that provides a common and repeated use, rules, guidelines, or characteristics for activities or their results, aimed at the achievement of the optimum degree of order in a given context. And then there's a note about they should be based on the results of science, technology, etc. Well, that means that a standard can be almost any document you want it to be. It can address anything. My reason for raising this is it's embarrassing. There was a meeting of the European standards bodies. Uh, we have the Committee of European Normalization, CEN, and there are 29 members. The 29 technical directors were meeting. 27 of them thought that a standard had to specify requirements. They did not understand that a standard can be guidance or rules. Again, this is important. People don't it, even within my committees, where I've been working with some people for 10 years or more, they still think a standard has to specify requirements, even though they've published guidelines. They seem to think the guidelines should be called something else. Monica, you have a question? Well, I, just, I just wanted to ask you about the this comment you are making that we have the same problem. I have here in some of our national uh, committees exactly the same the same comment and is uh, as you said that it is a big concern because uh, people don't understand that most of the standards are actually international standards are right. so uh, not not requiring standards and um, we don't need uh, a conformity assessment for everything. So no. that, that, that's a big issue and something that we have to try to emphasize in all our committees and remember that not everything needs to to be uh, 
to go to a formal process of performing the assessment is not necessary. Indeed. Yeah. Any other comments on that issue? No? Okay. Some would even question whether a standard has to be a document. So if you remember, Napoleon and his system international is based on a beam of platinum for the kilogram and a rod of platinum for the meter. Okay, we might change that, but originally the standard was physical objects. In fact, they were considered so precious that during the Second War, the Germans agreed with the Americans not to bomb the Bureau of Paid and Measures in Paris to avoid upsetting these two items. Okay? But the most expensive British standard we have is this fan of colors. Why? Because the wavelengths of the inks have to be precise. You cannot just type it out on your computer printer. And finding people who can specifically print at certain wavelengths of light is difficult and expensive. I'm sure in the university here, uh, you use colorimeters. How do you calibrate the colorimeters? Do you use sort of these type of color charts? I don't know. Um, Yeah. En la SIC sí se trabaja con el color. Eh, hay, hay colorímetros, eh, pero se trabaja eh, principalmente con colores aplicados al arte o a murales, por ejemplo, prehispánico. Y bueno, lo que se hace ahí es buscar más bien los componentes químicos de los colores, porque dependiendo de qué material es o más bien de qué época es, es, de, es el tipo de material que se usaba. Si era un material tipo proveniente de la tierra, como hierro o cromo, o si también pueden ser otro tipo de materiales orgánicos, como los que se derivan, por ejemplo, de flores como el cempasúchil, eh, palo de Brasil, etc. Entonces, sí, se estudia el color con colorímetros, pero también se generan espectros de elementos químicos o de resistencia. Uh, well, where actually researchers is talking about, or where a national cultural laboratory, like that, Nancy, that is um, over this this particular facility we have our national laboratory is working with colors, but also studying uh, art, no? and words, yeah. and trying to identify. Where the colors came from. It yes. Come from a particular plant or soil or something else. And they yeah. make some chemical analysis about that. So they, they work with these kind of spectrums of colors, mm -hmm. uh, but also translated or, or seen from uh, the chemistry point of view. Uh, I know in the artwork, uh, one of the quick tests for forgeries is uh, the test for Prussian blue ink, because before the invention of Prussian blue in the late 1800s, the only way you could get blue was to import this blue stone from Afghanistan, crush it to make your paint. And then suddenly after the late 1880s, there was an industrial process for blue, yellow, green uh, being manufactured. And you can just quickly test a, paint, uh, a, a picture to see 
someone says, oh, it was painted in 1500, it's extremely valuable. If it contains Prussian blue, you know it was painted after 1880. So, yes, very easy to ask. Okay. That, that's interesting, but that's no standardization. That's their voting. So the standardization part is how do we create color charts? Um, in industry, um, for engineering purposes, you often have furnaces where you're trying to heat components up to a certain temperature and you have to maintain them at a certain temperature for a certain period of time for annealing processes. Um, often the way the furnaces are regulated is by a color chart because you can tell by the heat of the flame, the color of the flame, and you measure it against the chart. So again, there are standards for sort of furnace temperature measurements based on color. But my point I was trying to make with this slide is that not all standards are documents. They can be physical objects. Uh, as we said when um, talking about the original measurement of weight, the carob seed was being used to measure the weight of diamond. Yeah. So some of the interesting facts about standardization, the top seven national standards of bodies in the world are the G7 countries. Um, is this accidental? We can look at various phases of development and industrialization throughout history. So you have pre-industrial revolution where you had mainly blacksmiths or individuals working uh, in a very local environment that the, the person putting the horseshoes on horses that was the main industry at that time um, and their system of working was an internal system that was horizontal and vertically integrated and most of the processes they did were measured by eye if you've seen the blacksmith work he doesn't use calibrated measuring equipment. He just gets the metal, he compares it to the horse, and it's a repeated craftsmanship level type activity. So there were no written more detailed standards. But then in the early industrialization phase, we start seeing specialization of labor. So there would be not just a general blacksmith, but there might be someone who's making nails, someone making horseshoes, someone making guns, but the craft starts separating. And we start seeing a certain amount of vertical integration, sorry, horizontal integration, but vertical outsourcing. And you start beginning to see individual companies or factories writing their own specifications. And the next stage was national standardization, where you start seeing specifications being produced nationally, uh, shared within industrial sectors, in order to start the processes of mass production. And then you start getting horizontal and vertical outsourcing, you start getting industry-wide trade specifications and, and move to national standardization. 
And the more recent phases, of course, global industrialization, concentration of single elements of value within a certain production facility, which could be anywhere in the world. And then you have the logistics supply chain to feed it to the centralized factory. So you have high levels of interdependence, for example, for lean production, global sourcing, and a dependence on international standardization. Um, there is a way of presenting this graphically. Um, so on one side, you've got the, the level of um, industrialization, and on the other side, we've got the level of standardization. Okay. If you want to put a time a time in this, well, really up to the early industrial time, you're talking about 1800 um, mass production, as we saw with Henry Ford. Actually, Henry Ford stole the idea from a butcher company at, uh, for meat, the, the idea of a production line. Um, but about 1900. And when do we think globalization really started? 1960s, 1970s, something right in about then. Um, in fact, it's a reflection of the point of where globalization started in the modern standards of BSI up to the 1980s. 80% 80 of our standards catalog was national standards. Today, 90% is international standards. So that shows when globalization started kicking in for standardization. So why should we want to standardize? Um, well, for that quality and conformity, um, for generating product and service sales, for simplifying purchasing mechanisms, for hygiene and food safety, for safety in general, for sustainability, quality of the built environment, for contracting or tendering purposes, for good management practices, for defining how you audit management systems, there are a variety of reasons. And we can say that standardization is critical to economic development because it allows concentration on areas of competitive advantage. Uh, it enables the move from mass production to lean production. It enables the move from local state to national to international systems as industry is globalized. And critically, it also supports the World Trade Organization's objective of the removal of barriers to trade. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Why is formal standardization good for a national economy? Well, there are four key identified areas. It assists in innovation. It enables national ideas to become accepted internationally. It balances producer and user interests, and it can assist in deregulation. So let's look at these in a little bit more detail. Uh, assisting innovation by sharing best practices, designers can focus on real product enhancement. Okay, you're not dealing with the basic stuff. As we were talking about with the cattle, what were the characteristics you have to deal with? A designer doesn't have to think about those anymore. He gets the standard, is the characteristics you must address. And he can use them as a checklist. It can help by setting benchmarks for performance, quality, and safety. It can help by establishing parameters for interoperability. And it can help by making transparent the technical requirements that innovative products must meet to gain global market acceptance. Okay, so that's the system innovation. It's enabling national ideas to become accepted internationally. Uh, I mean, if you have a national standard and you promote it to ISO or to the IEC and say, why don't you adopt this? You know, you are 
doing your country a huge service if that is accepted internationally because you're ahead of the game. Your producers have been using that standard. The rest of the world potentially hasn't. But when we look at the directives, we we'll look at how you play games on that issue to win the argument. Um, but it gives your industries competitive advantage if you can promote national standards to the international forum, definitely. Um, balancing producer and user interest. All the standards and market led reflect all interests, including small and medium enterprises, consumers, and government, and not just manufacturers. Um, standards try to prevent monopolies being created. So manufacturers love to create monopolies, and then they can charge the consumer or the user whatever price they want for, quite frankly, a really cheap product. But by bringing consumers and users into the discussion in developing the standard, that new way for control through standardization is removed or should be removed. That's important. So we're trying to promote fair competition and counteract unhealthy concentrations of economic power. Um, we're actually trying to reduce development, production, and transaction costs for both established businesses and new entrants to the market. If you've published a standard, then a new company wanting to enter, let's say, you know, manufacturing of computer motherboards or something like that, they can just go to the standard. They can see what they have to produce. Therefore, they know that they can enter the that sector of the market without any barriers. Um, lastly, as well, increasing the diversity and quality of suppliers for both producers and consumers. Because as soon as you produce a product standard, it gets picked up and new manufacturers start entering the market. So when you as a purchaser are looking for those items, you have greater variety of suppliers to choose from. So greater diversity. Assisting in deregulation. Um, regulation set general principles, but standards, as I've just said, by having all those parties involved in the development of the standard, you have the input of those people who actually have to use the standard. I mean, we know what it's like when your parliaments write legislation and you read it and you go, who wrote this? Do they live in the real world? Or are they living in sort of some legal colony on a different planet? Um, you know, actually standards are written in a much more usable language. I know people would contest that. We have certain problems with how we express things in standards, but Compared to legislation, it's a lot more readable. Also, standards tend to be much more practical because it has the involvement of the people who have to use them. Now, compared to legislation, you know, sometimes even to begin to change a piece of legislation, you have to have a parliamentary debate, and that can take years. Whereas with standards development processes, we have certain rules, but they can take just months. So we're much quicker at amending and updating uh, as circumstances change. Also, our standards are voluntary and indicative and not mandatory and prescriptive. When people write legislation, you have to be prescriptive. You have to be absolutely precise. There's very little leeway for descriptive or optional approaches. And also, because we allow uh, different sort of characteristics to be given for products, provided they meet the essential core requirement, it allows different routes to compliance, and so it doesn't stop innovation. And that, for countries, innovation is 
the lifeblood of what you're trying to do to export and win the world. Now, I mentioned the WTO, the World Trade Organization. Um, the World Trade Organization allows the adoption of international standards as national regulations without, um, this is where the legal language comes in, shall be rebuttably presumed not to create an unnecessary obstacle to international trade. So the World Trade Organization has recognized that adopting an international standard as a national standard does not cause a barrier to trade. So if you're going to re reference international standards in your uh, tariff systems for importing, if you base those on international standards, you will not get complaints from the WTO. And that's very important. Or that has been very important for globalization. At the moment, the world seems to be in reverse, going away from globalization back to nationalization. So I don't know where that's going. Monica, you have a question? Just a, just a comment regarding this issue. Um, now, with the COVID, uh, this part was very, is very important, or was very important, because most of the pharma, uh, sorry, most of the pharma standard, uh, not related to medical devices and medicine, so on, and many of you work on that area. Uh, our national regulations uh, come from international standards, as well as the Americans and the Europeans. So that's why it, it was, you know, relatively quick that some vaccines and some medical devices were accepted in, in our country. So this is a very good example of, of this. Thank you. Okay. Um, ISO itself has a published policy statement about what standards do. And this is the statement. It repeats what I was saying about why do we do standardization, you know, for quality, safety, reliability, efficiency, compatibility, interchangeability, and provide these benefits at an economical cost. They contribute to making the development, manufacturing of, and supply of products and services more efficient, safer, and cleaner. They make trade between countries easier and fairer. ISO standards also safeguard consumers and users in general of products and services and make their lives simpler. A very general statement. Okay. Again, who benefits from standardization? Um, we can separate industry, government regulators, and society. Industry, hopefully you become more competitive by using standards and by offering products and services that will be accepted globally. That was the point Monica was just making. Uh, it enables you to enter new markets more easily. Uh, hopefully, it will enable you to raise your profits by offering products with increased quality, compatibility, and safety, reduce costs by not reinventing the wheel every time, and benefit from the knowledge and best practice of leading experts from around the world. You're getting free best practice when you buy a standard. You know, the world's best people for a particular subject have come together to create that standard. And you as a producer get that information just for the cost of obtaining a standard. Um, government, well, we've talked about regulation, but harmonies in regulations across countries can boost global trade. Um, that in turn increases credibility and trust throughout the supply chain and makes it easier for countries to outsource or to specialize. And for society, 
obviously we as consumers end up with a wider choice of safe and reliable products and services at competitive prices. Uh, best practice and concerted action at the organizational level to practically address global challenges such as environmental protection, climate change, and sustainability. Now, that might have sounded very hypothetical, but this is the results of uh, research BSI commissioned um, in about 2013-14, I think, was the report. And it's an investigation onto the benefits of standards uh, in industry. Um, DEIS is our government department for trade and industry. Um, and previously it was called the Department for Trade and Industry, DTI. So, um, but it looks at the, the value of standardization during the period 1921 to 2013. So quite a long range uh, of period. And it came to the overall conclusion that standardization is worth 8.2 billion pounds, British pounds, to the UK economy. I think 8.2 billion is about eight and a half million US dollars at this time, because the exchange rate is very poor. Previously, it would have been $10 billion. But, um, and when they looked into that, they said 89% of companies say that standards contribute to com um, compliance with regulations, such as for health and safety. 84% so using standards enhance their reputation. 73% says it allows for greater control of environmental problems. All beneficial thing and significantly beneficial. And then when we look at growth, this might be helpful for telling government about this. You know, 28.4% of annual GDP growth can be attributed to using standards. 37.4% of productivity growth is attributed to standards. Um, 6.1 billion additional exports attributed to standards. And in terms of small businesses, 41% or larger businesses, 36%, using standards encourages them to export. So this is actual research, it's, it shows that there is huge benefits to using standards. I'm now going to turn looking at the types of standards. Um, this is from BSI's own rules, which we call British Standard Zero. We have slightly different types of standards to ISO. Um, so, we define the first category as specifications, and I'm sure you're all familiar with that. Um, then there's a method standard. Many of you working in laboratories, you have methods of test. So um, that's nothing particularly new. Vocabularies, we're all familiar with vocabularies. Code of practice, I'll come back to that. That's one that you probably are not familiar with. Guide, well, guideline standards, we have those, and classification standards. We don't call them classification standards, but we know that, you know, if you're looking at the standard for different grades of steel, it's a classification standard. A code of practice is um, interesting. A code of practice is a guidance document. An example would be for how do you safely handle large plates of glass. So you see all these modern buildings being created and they have what, three meter by four meter plates of glass being put on the outside of the building as the cladding. So how do you safely handle those types of pieces of glass? You can't be prescriptive because that you have different types of glass being used on different buildings, different sizes, different factors. 
in the construction because some may be laminated with plastic, others won't. So a code of practice says, you know, it's a good idea to wear a pair of gloves because glass is sharp. It's a good idea to use those big suction um, things to lift up the plates of glass. But while it's written as guidance, many of our legal regulations say that if an organization does not follow the code of practice, then it can be prosecuted. So a code of practice is a set of guidelines being used as regulation. It's not a situation you find in ISO. The, this concept has not been adopted there. Um, but so it's a slightly British and unique category. But you could think about adopting it through DGM if you want to. Um, ISO has several types of documents. Um, when we talk about standards, most of us are referring to full international standards. And for something to be published as a full international standard, ISO claims that the standard bodies that voted on it had given 75% of them had approved it. So that's the criteria for a full international standard. Something that's not quite as well supported can be published as a technical specification, which only gets about 66% approval. In terms of the layout, uh, sorry, I should go down one more. Um, there's also a publicly available specification, which just requires a simple majority. And then below that is an international workshop agreement, which is where we would have a meeting like this. We would discuss what to put in the document. And at the end of the meeting, if we agreed it, it would be published. Um, now, between an international standard, a technical specification, a publicly available specification, and a workshop agreement, the way that the text is presented or the way it's written, there will be no difference. So a, a PAS looks exactly the same as an international standard. The difference is the approval rating given to that document. And sometimes that can be useful. If you're dealing with a, a new area, you want to put out standards to help industry quite quickly. So you might put out a PAS where, you know, you've got 50% support. But the difference with PASs and technical specifications compared to an international standard is that they are required to be reviewed much more frequently or much more quickly than a full international standard. So after being published, an international standard has to be reviewed within five years. But a, a PAS or a technical specification has to be reviewed within three years. That means there is an expectation that you will be changing it and updating it frequently. Also, there are very strong recommendations that a PAS or a technical specification should be changed into a full standard after two revision cycles. So that really means that, you know, if you're putting out a document, you're trying to develop a new area, you've got a revision cycle, well, three years to do the review, a couple of years to amend the document and republish the next edition, three years for the review beyond that. You've got a life of about 10 years of a PAS or a technical specification before really you should be going for a full standard. And in terms of developing a new sector or a new product or something like that, 10 years is a long time. You know, think about how quickly uh, changes occurred in the early days of mobile phones. Every six months, there was a new phone with a new uh, app or ability on that phone. So the markets initially with new products develop very quickly. And so it's not unreasonable to have a 10 year life cycle. 
Uh, the last category, technical report, is supposed to be only for informative material. So, for example, in the Committee for ISO 9001, we would conduct surveys on what users felt about quality. And we would then publish that survey, or the results of that survey, as a technical report. It's not a standard, it's information. There is unfortunately still a historic problem because ISO only introduced technical specifications, PLSs, and international workshop agreements about 10 years ago. And before that, the development document, which is now a technical specification, was referred to as a technical report. So if you go through the ISO catalogue, there are still some technical reports giving specifications. Okay, so there's a bit of confusion there. There's a bigger point of confusion, which is some people are saying, well, how can we publish a document as a guidance document if you're going to call it a technical specification? There's a contradiction. So there are some discussions we'll also about the naming protocols for technical specifications. But it seems to be a fairly established name right now. So I'm not sure we're going to see that changed quickly. What are the main sorry, Monica, please? Yeah, uh, regarding the revenue, that's like that Something that is sometimes confusing for our experts is actually how this reporting uh, 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 works. Because sometimes uh, an international about this big online is approved of very few countries. Uh, that actually, but they are actually meeting this 75%. So yeah. I don't know if you want, could, could you uh, talk about this issue? Because we have had a lot of uh, conversation about that. Actually, this is a case, for example, about this standard we were talking about the education okay. standard that was approved, but very few countries and has been very controversial since the beginning. Um, later on, I will tell you about ISO so having 165 uh, national standards bodies as its members. Um, but it also has rules about what is the quorum, the minimum quorum for participating in the development of a new standard. And um, surprisingly, the quorum level is five countries. So when we say 75% approval, that's four out of the five countries. So yes, an international standard can be agreed by just four countries. Now, you, you, you have to put that in context sometimes. I mean, um, when computing stuff all started happening in the 1970s, who knew about the computing stuff? It was mainly your IBMs, your Motorola's, your Microsoft. So, you know, having just four countries participating in, at that time, trying to establish computing or electronic standards was not unreasonable. And that is often the case with a new sector that there will be very few countries with the knowledge and the expertise to contribute. Now, when it comes to revising those standards, second or third revision, you suddenly find there's a hundred countries wanting to participate. But as a way of initiating standardization, maybe four countries is not an unreasonable limit. It causes problems when you get to a mature standard and you still only have four countries participating. Then you really do have to wonder what's going on and if there isn't some kind of market distortion occurring. 
But that's the technical management board's role is to oversee those sorts of issues. Okay. Any other questions on that one? No. Okay. Um, so who are the main international standard bodies? Um, ISO, I've been talking about a lot, the International Electrotechnical Commission, IEC. Um, there's also the International Telecommunications Union. There are many others, Codex, uh, for example, for food safety. But in standards world, these are the ones we normally refer to. Um, you also have regional bodies. I've given the three European ones of SEM, which is the equivalent of ISO, SEMELEC, which mirrors the IEC, and ETSI, which mirrors the International Telecommunications Union. Now, I think COPANT is trying to act in the same way, but it has it actually published COPANT standards yet? I don't think it has. So, uh, I haven't seen it, but uh, I don't know if or where colleagues from BGN know. Uh, eh, Copanda pur ha publicado este estándares únicamente sobre Copan, bueno, para la región Copan, o solamente son este, eh, equivalentes de de la ISO, que es lo que normalmente hacen ustedes, ¿saben? Vamos a darle el micrófono, porque si no tiene con el micrófono, quiero que yo te dé una pregunta, porque está haciendo la comparación de ISO y ISO, que tiene que dar gente a un nivel de Thank you. Yeah, there is a couple of regulations. They need to be a different a standardization body that they approve. And the cat even process for this regulation. Uh, I don't know, I don't know if Ariel can explain more. Yes. Y muchas gracias. Eh, por parte de Copac, hay eh, dos comités técnicos nacionales que se enfocan al desarrollo de energía y energía renovable. Se desarrollan normas técnicas regionales, nada más para el área, para la región de Latinoamérica. Y si bien toman como referencia alguna referencia, algunas normas en el de IEC que eh, se desarrollan en el área de la región. So, there are uh, two. Uh, at least that are actually for the region, that is energy and renewable energy, and they are mainly from Latin America. Okay, thank you. So we could add COPAN as a regional uh, area. Um, there's also one in the Pacific area as well. Um, but again, the Pacific area one is more of a, a cooperation between standards bodies. They've not yet moved to publishing standards, whereas SEN, SEMLEC have, and you just told me that COPAN is also publishing. Okay. And then, of course, we have the national level standards bodies such as DGM or ANSI from America or BSI from the UK. Okay. What are the different models for national standards bodies? There are significant variations. Uh, some are government departments, some are government agencies, some are private associations, and some are private companies. Um, the associations tend to be not-for-profit type organizations. Uh, whereas the private companies, obviously, they have to make profit somehow. But there's no rules internationally as to how you structure your national standards body. You as a country have to decide what is most effective for you. How many national standards bodies can a country have? 
Um, some just have one. UK, we have one national standards body, but we have many standards bodies. Um, some have two. Germany is a good example. Uh, DIN, I think most of us will have heard of. And DIN is the main German standard. You often see the DIN mark on German manufactured products. They, DIN represents ISO. But it has a different body, VBE, for the IEC. Completely separate. In fact, there's a marvelous problem uh, between ISO and IEC in that uh, DIN proposed a standard to ISO, and ISO said, but this is for an electrical standard. It has to go to the IEC. But DIN said, but then VBE would get all the revenues from selling this standard. You can't give it to the IEC. It was eventually resolved by creating an ISO committee in the IEC just to make sure that they maintain the revenues for its idea. It's a wonderful political solution. ISO SC31, uh, sorry, IEC SC31, if you want the reference. Um, but then we, we have um, some countries with multiple standard bodies. And um, perhaps the USA is the biggest one that we all come across. We all know about ASTM or SAE um, or the IEEE. Yes? No, you're not? Okay. So uh, ASTM, American Society for Testing and Materials, SAE, the Society of American Engineers, uh, the IEEE is the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers. Um, IAQG is the International Aerospace Quality Group. And the IATF is the International Automotive um, Task Force. The, the problem with these is that um, they've tried to relabel themselves as ASTM International, SAE International, so that they can uh, cooperate with ISO. But most of us still think of them as being US. And most of us still think of them as trying to dictate US ideas to the rest of the world. There is an issue about that um, and a great deal of sensitivity. But the main thing to note is that ISO and IEC will only accept one standards body per country. Sorry, Monica. You're Maybe this could be interesting for you, but here in Mexico we have the uh, all the energy products like we have all the four models. We yeah. work with the four models here in Mexico. Okay. And about the standardization bodies, we have a uh, ten standardization bodies. Mm -hmm. And in ISO, we uh, the only standardization body that participates is the DGN. Yes. Yes. Thank you. No, in, in fact, uh, Canada has a very similar model for you. Um, Canada has about 11 recognized national standards bodies, uh, CSA being the largest one. Um, and because of disputes in about the 1970s and 80s as to what area each standards body should be working on, the Canadian government created the Standards Council of Canada, SCC, which has oversight and regulates between the, the 11 different standards bodies. Okay, but in the US, that really hasn't happened. I mean, why do they have NIST separate from ANSI? To me, it seems illogic. NIST is a government funded organization, ANSI is a private corporation. Um, so, why is it that ANSI became the ISO member, not NIST? I, I don't know the history of the politics of that one. Yes. Well, like I asked that to one of our American colleagues because I couldn't understand it either. And the reason was a legal reason. Okay. The NIST uh, was uh, forced uh, to separate 
these activities from the methodology one way to work on what we may do. Um, they, they have to send the standardization activities to ANSI mm -hmm. and also the conformity assessment activities to other yeah. and now um, and I take the yeah. So that's how that, that was the reason, was a, a real reason. Uh, but also, I'd like to comment on what you just said before yeah. about uh, how Mexican um, works and I was a member of IPT um, from, from some years and uh, other American uh, standardization body, which is not this is the best in computing. Um, and they work pretty different uh, from us. So the difference is that in the case for people uh, like me, for example, they uh, work a lot of researchers and produce a lot of new technology. And mm -hmm. that's why they are standardized. So they are standardized, uh, standardized it as a way to transfer the technology. So um, in our case, what we do is actually in those technologies that are available. Uh, what we do as a country is to tropicalize them into a specific mix, but we do not create uh, so much uh, new technology and standards. So that the main, main difference to me for the American model which is very successful in, in, in that area. I know where model which is more dependable in what others do, uh, unfortunately. So that's uh, something that probably we should ahead mm -hmm. and like to change it because we have very good institutions that we want to develop some of the technology and model to it. Okay, thank you for that. But the point is, one standards body becomes the number of ISO or IEC. Okay. Um, I mentioned very briefly, ITU has a different model. Um, is anyone here involved with telecommunications and ITU? No, okay. So um, when you go back in the history of telecommunications to when it was um, you know, tap, 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 and the telegraph wires and things like that. Um, most countries assigned responsibility for the telegraph to their postal commission, the post office. Um, and up until about the 1980s, most post offices were still responsible for telephone systems completely. So what you find is that ITU, the main members are the postal services or the telecoms regulators from the different countries. Um, and there can be more than one per country and it's a subscription-based model. I'll talk about that a, a bit later on, but it, it is slightly different from ISO, okay? Um, this is a chart which is taken from 2016. It's a shame that ISO doesn't update its charts as frequently as the data. Um, it's a bit difficult to read, I appreciate that. But at the top it's saying uh, in 2016, ISO had 21,000 published standards. Today it's about 24,000 published standards. Um, at that time it had about 4,997 active projects. Today, it's about five and a half thousand. Um, at that time, it had 247 technical committees. Today, it's 255. It had 508 subcommittees. Now it's 530. And it had 2,674 working groups. Now it's closer to 3,000. That's a lot of technical activity. You know, you, you're talking uh, 250 subcommittees and 
uh, so 250 committees and 500 sub subcommittees, 750 committees, 3,000 working groups. Wow, that's a lot of people we need. Now, there are different categories of membership by national standards bodies in ISO. Um, you can be a full member, in which case you get full rights to participate in all of the projects. You get full voting rights on everything that ISO does. You can adopt ISO standards free of charge, and you may sell ISO standards without paying ISO a royalty if you have adopted them. If you've not adopted them, you have to pay them a royalty. But we have to recognize that, you know, there are different levels of uh, economic development in different countries. And um, we have developing countries and we have micro countries. And some of them, they really don't have a lot of technical expertise. They're very reliant on what they can receive from around the rest of the world. So we have correspondent members and subscriber members. And you can see the differences up there as to what rights uh, correspondents and subscribers have. Um, as I mentioned, I've updated the previous chart. So ISO today is about 165 member countries. On the chart, I think it was 161, um, of which 124 are full members, 39 correspondents, and four are subscribers and DGN is a full member, okay? How is the governance structure um, created in ISO? Well, uh, at the very top is the ISO General Assembly, and they have a good party once a year. And if you can get to that party, get to the party. It's always good. Uh, it's September every year. Uh, you find about 700 people attending. Uh, this year it was in Doha, last year in London. It's not often the General Assembly comes out with any astounding decisions, but last year it adopted what it calls the London Declaration on Climate Change. And that is now stirring the ISO Technical Management Board, which regulates all of the technical work, um, to encourage committees to start writing requirements for preventing climate change into their standards. Um, it's creating some very interesting discussions. But, so the General Assembly is like the meeting of shareholders in a company once a year, big event. Um, below that is the ISO Council, um, where about 25 member bodies are represented. Um, we don't call them permanent members, but there are about five repeating members. ANSI from America, uh, AFNO from France, BIM from Germany, BSI from the UK, uh, JISC from Japan, and China is desperately trying to become one of those permanent members. The other 20 members are on a rotational basis, about three years. Um, below the council is the technical management board. It's again about 15 countries represented. Again, you have the same five semi-permanent members and the other positions are on a rotational basis. Um, the council is responsible for making recommendations to the General Assembly. So the council is really the most powerful body in ISO, but overarching is the General Assembly. Uh, the council is where all the money men go. It's where they decide what price standards should be sold at, uh, what revenues ISO should receive from national standards bodies, etc. And at the bottom, we have all the technical committees. Um, that's where the 255 of them sit. But feeding into the council and also to the technical management board um, are various policy committees. 
Um, one of which we all find very strange is ISO CASCO, the ISO Policy Committee for Conformity Assessment. So all of you are writing standards and you have an expectation of conformity assessment. ISO CASCO has existed for about 25 years. In that time, we're not aware of it ever having issued a policy statement. Instead, it's created standards in the ISO IEC 17000 series for how conformity assessment shall be conducted. But it's never issued a policy statement. So we keep saying, why is it a policy committee? Shouldn't it be a technical committee? There's some arguments going on there. But there are other policy committees such as uh, Remco for reference materials. Um, there's a policy committee for developing countries, ISO DEVCO. Uh, I haven't listed those, but they're feeding in they're up sometimes to the technical management board or to the ISO council or sometimes even directly to the General Assembly. You have a question? Uh, my question okay. my question is in relation to how custom uh, what is the power of custom in interrupting the second government or in guiding or advising? Uh, I just wanted to know and understand power that's a very interesting thing. So whenever you ask ISO a question about, look, that committee is interrupting the work in my committee, please adjudicate and make a decision. ISO's answer is, why don't you go and have a quiet conversation somewhere and come back with what you agree on? And we say, but we're coming to you because we can't agree on something. Please decide, make a direction. No, 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 you go and have a quiet conversation. So when you say, what is the power of CASCO? Uh, if CASCO publishes something, then the technical management board will say, well, why are you challenging what CASCO has produced? You know, CASCO is the authority in this area. Or I, I could use a different example. Um, the committee for ships was producing uh, standards about uh, environmental protection for ships. Yet the Committee for Environmental Management was saying that we deal with everything to do with environment. Okay, so what happens is that ISO will recognize that certain bodies have a leading role in certain areas, but they have to talk with the other technical committees that want to do work in that area. Um, I don't know if you're involved in management systems work, such as ISO 9000, ISO 14000, these kind of standards. But um, because of issues with auditors and auditor qualification, the committees that do with quality, environment, road safety, everything else, health and safety, wanted to specify requirements for auditor competence. But that's part of conformity assessment. So what happens is you then get joint working groups between CASCO and the committee that wants to produce the standard. And eventually it's published. In fact, they're published as conformity assessment standards, in this case, the ISO IEC 17021 series. Um, but that's how ISO tends to work. It, it's not. Casco has done this, we are dictating to you. It's a system of cooperation to begin with. I mean, sometimes you do get points where Casco says, no, you are wrong, we're not going to let you do that. Because that contradicts everything else we've established in the world of conformity assessment. But generally, we try and cooperate because TMB won't let us won't make a decision for us. Okay. Monica.
Um, well, we, we are members, uh, uh, Dr. Escobar, we are members of CASCO, uh, the university represents um, the engineer actually in, in CASCO. Uh, this committee, as Charles mentioned, is a very special one because what they, um, its objective is to produce standards to evaluate the requirement of standards. And as Charles mentioned, it causes a lot of problems sometimes with, with the standards that are um, that once were done by the technical uh, committees. No? So in the case of the DC 31 331, which is the biodiversity one when you are expert. Uh, what is going to happen is that those standards that we already agree are going to be a requirements standard, like the French uh, standard or French proposal uh, about the management system of biodiversity. Uh, that one, when we produce it, we work very close to finish it. CASCO is uh, going to uh, see that we are going to produce a standard uh, which is going to be certificate. So in that case, they are going to ask for a joint committee of experts from CASCO and from the biodiversity one in order to produce guides to assess that standard and, uh, and give some guide to the certification body so, so the certification bodies to go to perform uh, external audits. So it's basically what, how they work in technical committees. And um, from my point of view, it's too powerful because we were talking about how powerful was it. It is very powerful uh, in the context of ISO plus. Uh, they actually uh, Inside, no. So how these assessments are going to be conducted, no? To these standards. So and as Charles said, sometimes in technical committees we disagree a lot with the vision of, of Casco experts. But at the end of the day, what's happening in Casco is that most of the experts came from certification bodies or accreditation bodies. So it's really a strange people that thought that came from academy and joined that, that committee concert and really was enthusiastic uh, in it. Um, uh, it is really a strange. So that's why, uh, in, from my point of view, they call it because they have a particular vision of uh, the bodies who are going to assess that and provide a certificate. No, which is different from the experts that create actually the requirement the standard. So, uh, but at the end of the day, I think the object it is correct that they have to produce both them. They have to produce uh, a guide a standard to assess the requirement standard. Okay. Is uh, it is a different. Committee, Charles just explained that it's not exactly a technical committee. Uh, um, it is a committee, but let's say it's a, one of those special ones, uh, as the developing country one that is another special committee in ISO, and there are others. Okay. Yeah. Um, Monica, I have about 20 more slides. Can I continue talking till quarter past one? Or do you need the coffee break before then? We, we have the coffee. The coffee break is ready. Uh, so do you want to, to have it now? Or, will you, or can we... Uh, go to 15 minutes past one uh, yeah. uh, and finish the presentation. So what do you want to do? Do you want to have the coffee now or continue? Okay, let's, 
The coffee break. Okay. Everybody is happy with having the coffee break right now? Okay, fantastic. So we will have the coffee break. Okay. So we will return um, um one ten, please. Okay. Mm -hmm. 